Welcome everyone. This is a talk I gave at the Artificial Life Conference 2020 in mid-July. And as a few of you wanted to see it, I decided to upload it here. I have to warn you that the talk is directed to an academic audience, so it might be a little dry. But I did my best to uncover it a little humor, and my subject is still pretty light, so I hope you'll find it interesting. That being said, I'll leave you to it. So, welcome everyone. I want to extend my thanks and awe at the organizing committee, and I feel so lucky having the chance to present some of my ideas to such an awesome community. Um, that being said, I'm going to present my project, uh, the Bibbits, and try to show you that maybe some other projects in artificial life, uh, maybe even yours, uh, could draw inspiration from the field of game development. Um, so I believe that I will introduce some ideas that might be well aligned with many needs of the field of artificial life. There are two key threads, in my opinion, that are particularly relevant. Uh, continuous development and community building around the project. And I'll try to show you that there might be value in some of those ideas. However, I don't and can't really pretend to have an absolute solution that can be applied to any project. So this is very much an a la carte talk. Uh, I fully allow you to discard any information you find superfluous and to just remember what feels interesting and applicable to your present, past or future projects. So first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about me. Um, above all, I want to stress that I'm not a researcher. Uh, I'm a hobbyist in the field and I'm very much a newcomer here, uh, especially in artificial life. So please be understanding of any errors I might commit and maybe take everything I say with some grain of salt. Uh, my studies were in electrical engineering and I did get some research experience in the field of semiconductors and front-end electronics, but I didn't continue after obtaining my degree. As for my present uh, profession, I'm a full-time system engineer working on developing autonomous industrial vehicle, which may sound related uh, in some ways to artificial life, but I assure you that the word uh, industrial um, kind of comes in to ruin any possible connection to be drawn. Although I've always been fascinated by science and the complexities since a young, since, since a young age, uh, I started programming for fun uh, around 15 years old, uh, when I was around 15 years old. And since, th since then, I've always been creating some kinds of simulations to test out some of my ideas, uh, the bib being, me being the most relevant and successful of those. So I'll give you a summary of what the bibits is, as to give you s some context for the rest of the talk. Um, the Bibbits is an artificial life simulation project, although when I started working on it, I didn't even know what uh, that artificial life was even a field. Some of its uh, particular features are a real-time graphical and um, interactive simulation. It also displays both phenotypic and behavioral evolution, presents environments uh, with natural selection that that's driven by the environment. Sorry, I think you call this uh, open-ended evolution in the field, but uh, I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Also, uh, closed-loop energy cycle and kind of biological uh, reproduction. So, uh, as a quick example, the first the bibits have to consume different elements to gain energy. That can be either plant, uh, meat, pellets, uh, and other bibits. And they then use energy to do everything else, uh, be it uh, moving around, producing pheromones, laying eggs, uh, and so on. Uh, pretty, I tried to be as descriptive as possible as to what um, consumes energy, but in fact, it's pretty much every action that isn't consuming something. Um, I, I tried, the, here's a more complete diagram of possible energy transfers. Uh, it's not full uh, because it would be very complex, but um, Basically, the bibits have an energy reserve, which they can use to do actions, and and a health reserve, uh, which represent the energy contained in their muscles and other body part. When they die, the reserve is released as meat, which can be eaten by carnivores or rot away and become waste. 
um, any energy used uh, destructively by the bibbits will also become waste, uh, which will then be used to fertilize uh, new pellet growth uh, plants, especially uh, closing the circle and ensuring that the total amount stays constant. It's also um, a very dynamic environment. Uh, I don't uh, like I said the simulation is a real time uh, simulation. So you can experience it as you as evolution is going around. As an example, they have the capacity to see each other, uh, control their own movement, uh, produce pheromones, hurt each other, and much more. So I'm sure I don't need to convince any of you that the very complex behaviors can arise from the initial possibilities. They also have a genetic code of float values, which can mutate through uh, generations, things like diet, size, color, and much more. Uh, as a quick, uh, here's a complete list that maybe you can pause and go through. But as a quick summary, they have many biological values, things like size, P, diet, X, development variables, color, mutation factors, which influence the speed at which they, they mutate, um, vision, variables, and so on. So uh, one I often get asked about <laughs> is uh, that uh, wow factor gene. And honestly, that just me. I've, that was just me having fun. But if it gets high enough, they get a cool guitar. Uh, because I believe it's important to do things for fun sometimes. I'm also continuously adding new genes. And recently, I've been to toying with the idea of upgrading their appearance to generate uh, unique procedural sprites for each bibit. Uh, that would give us a better insight as to uh, what genes they express and uh, and and so on. So instead of just colors, um, as an example here, we could see that uh, if I try go and get the pointer, we can see that uh, the mouth would represent the diet, um, the 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 fins and uh, paddles could represent speed and things like that. Um, so yeah, um, just an interesting thought which doesn't add anything to the simulation, but it's just nice to better to look at it and makes for a more interesting sim simulation to play around with. Um, like I said, they also have, uh, they also present uh, behavioral evolution, um, which I used to point out that their capacity to evolve and mutate their brain. Um, at first I built it, I built a, uh, my own implementation of RTNEAT, which is a real-time version of the NEAT algorithm, neural evolution of uh, augmenting topologies, which I'm sure, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. But since it's many iterations and development it has grown quite far from the initial implementation and has now become pretty much its own, um, its own uh, uh, algorithm. Um, so, as shown, they have uh, access to neural networks. Um, in fact, all their, their decisions are made through neural networks. I mean, uh, like in this case, we see that um, it evolved to have a connection between the constant node and backward, so it constantly go backward, and then uh, turns toward pellets. Uh, so I don't know how that's uh, useful, um, um, but life works in mysterious ways, so. <laughs> and. Of course, we'll agree that this is a simple enough brain. Um, and of course, it can get very easily, uh, very messy um, because there is no, uh, there is no in, uh, insight or, sorry, I'll take that back. Um, it often gets more busy than uh, very simple networks because life is messy. And uh, the fact that my drawing algorithm is also pretty noobish, uh, doesn't help much. Uh, as a side note, the, the talk from uh, Michaels McGuffin on Monday was very interesting for this. He presented a lot of uh, graph drawing um, algorithms and insights. As you can see, my, <laughs> my, uh, my tests with force direct graphs so far weren't uh, very far and I still have a very long way to go. But, um, one one thing he pointed out was the stress majorization algorithm, and I'll go. I'll have a nice time looking into that. 
Um, I look forward to learn uh, about the, this algorithm because it seems very promising. Um, also, so they have a list of their present available sensors. Um, we have many metabolic and biological values, which they have the capacity to use as inputs for their brain systems. Uh, like, as an example, biological values, self-awareness, pretty much, uh, internal clock system, their vision system, which obviously represents the big majority of their input nodes, and some other for the sensing of pheromones in their environments. Again, I'm constant, continuously developing and adding new features and sensors. So this is just uh, what I have so far. As far action, as, far as action goes, um, and their output nodes, uh, we have nodes for moving around. Uh, their different desires, um, like uh, laying an egg, eating, uh, repu uh, rep uh, sexual reproduction, growth, uh, but also uh, reset for the internal clock system, different output for interacting with others. As an example, uh, grab things, which can be other bibits, food, um, eggs, and things like that. Uh, and a few, of course, to produce pheromones. I'm also starting to work on emotional neurons and white behavior neurons, which would have a more general and complex effect on their body processes and behaviors. As an example, having a uh, early neuron, which would encourage them to override their their previous uh, uh, direction uh, and and uh, speed uh, neurons to match that of uh, of others around them and kind of like go toward Boyd Boyd's uh, uh, Boyd's actions or something like that. Yeah. Um, one another side note. Uh, another quick side note. Uh, at first, I implemented pheromones to allow for social behaviors. Uh, however, I was surprised by how it usually evolves to be integrated in a species. In fact, most of the times, the development of use of pheromones in a species follows a similar path. Um, first, the bibit develops a random mutation uh, uh, between um, um, a particular response to a type of pheromones, even if it's not in a in, in the environment. Uh, as an example uh, here, uh, uh, yeah, they, they evolved to have a specific input to, um, to sensing some specific pheromones and healing themselves. And there is no such pheromones in the environment. That's just a random mutation. Um, but then that mutation will be passed on to its uh, offsprings. Um, since, especially since it's not particularly a heavy price to pay to keep around. As a re result, it gets passed down. Now the descendant have an, an incentive to evolve production of that specific type of pheromones uh, as a form of autocrine signal to produce that behavior. Of course, uh, there is no actual incentive. It's just like a natural selection. And because if it's there, it would provide them a small advantage. So one. Um, so when it does, and a bibit actually evolved to produce said pheromones uh, from another input or something like that, then it triggers itself through an autocrine, autocrine signaling. So um, it will, in this case, which, which is pretty, uh, pretty useful, when it receives damage, it will start producing pheromones, that specific kind of pheromones, then in its environment, it will sense its own pheromones, and then, uh, of course, that produce healing. So, in the sense, they, they kind of I wired the pheromone system to heal themselves when they receive damage. So, it's just another way for them to evolve a particular response to one stimulus. So it's instead, uh, it's just that it then gets pr uh, uh, through the environment to, uh, to stimulate themselves. And then, um, well, in this case, um, we can see that it produces the behavior, but then um, all the descendants from that species, uh, from that singular uh, member, will then respond to the same stimulus. So that whole species will share the response of individuals and all start bolstering their healing ability when they sense one of their members has been attacked. 
Since the behavior is now well implemented in the species, they are free to evolve additional interaction with the specific pheromones. An example would be other members of that species evolving to flee the scene when they sense another's members attacked pheromones. And um, give me a second. Okay, so um, other even other species now can now um, uh, can now evolve uh, relationships toward that specific type of pheromones. As an example, the predator of one, of that particular species, in this case, the 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 gray bibbits, um, uh, they could evolve to track that trail toward an earth prey. Or uh, this so. Yeah, sorry, this ended up being a pretty long side note, but I thought it was a very interesting development I observed. Um, but yeah, the, um, uh, back on track, the Bibbits is also an interactive environment uh, where you can directly interact with your mouse. You can drag the bits around, pellets and eggs uh, for fun, even to steer evolution in one particular uh, direction. This helps a lot in making a more fun experience and allows user to have a more personal relationship with the bibbits. Um, it just creates for a very much uh, uh, more complex, uh, I would say some sort of anthropomorphizing, but allowing uh, the users to interact with the, the artificial life has come a great way, in my opinion. So. A quick, a quick story now. Um, at first, the Bibbits was only an idea I kept in my head for quite a long time. I started programming when I was a little bored um, uh, during my first year of university, and I kept working on it um, as a fun side project through my studies. Uh, last year, after finishing my degree and before starting to work, I decided to upload the video showcasing the project. It garnered, it garnered a lot of interest and since then I've been working on the project and posting updates and videos. It has now grown to be a pretty big part of my life. <laughs> um, it's hard to say where it is going, but uh, one thing is sure is that I'm far from being done with this project. Uh, in fact, through the months it has garnered a pretty sizable following on YouTube, uh, with now, as of uh, July 2020, uh, nearly 12,000 subscribers and multiple hundred thousand views shared across my videos. Um, you'll have to excuse those baby title um, and claims, uh, as that's just how things work, are done on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, so... In, sh in short, uh, the Bibbits, aside from an artificial life simulation, is uh, also a YouTube channel with moderate success, a playable demo you can download right now um, on itch.io, which is a game development platform, uh, a subreddit where the community shares ideas, uh, questions and memes, but also a project that has started acquiring a reasonable financial support. Um, so, okay. Uh, what does that has to do with uh, you and this talk? So, uh, I'll try. I'll try to convince you that there is many benefits in doing things like I did and continue developing one particular project. Um, I, I, I'm sure there is um, uh, so much I can I can uh, bring to the table. So, because first of all, I see that um, many projects in the community are one shots. They are worked on and developed for one purpose, be it for one paper, one doctorate or anything. But when finished, they are discarded or left and abandoned, which aside from making the poor projects themselves sad is a bummer in, them, in my opinion. But don't misunderstand me. I know in many cases that's just the way things are and that's okay. But I still believe that there is a case to make for taking a project and continuing development after its natural end. In fact, it makes sense that a project that is worked on for a longer stretch of time will usually go further in its development, offer more potential for interesting insights, but also it allows to dedicate more time to the presentability of the project and allow a community to develop around the project. It's also fun to have time to work on additional nice to have features like the wall factor and things like procedural sprites, which again, don't bring anything to the complexity of the simulation, but, but isn't, uh, still has value uh, to the community it will interact with, but also uh, for you as you work on the project. 
Um, a good example is Dave Ackley's uh, Splat and T2 Tile Projects. He has a YouTube channel with a decent following where is he where he is sharing regular developments and keep his audience updated on the progress of the project. He also has an active community of contributors and interested followers which, with which he interacts with regularly in specific chat rooms and things like that. Uh, and I think he, his success is well known in the community here. Um, the pivot itself is another example of a project that profited a lot from being continuous. It allowed me to continuously add more features, adding more to the complexity of the simulation. Uh, as a result, it both slowly started getting more and more research worthy, as well as accumulating a significant community of followers and contributors. So, since earlier, I've been talking a lot about building a community, but what is there to gain specifically and explicitly from a community? Well, a having a community following and interacting with your project has many great advantages, uh, which I'll try to convince you of, and I'm sure that many of you are already convinced. But um, first of all, uh, well, one thing is that we all crave in the scientific community is uh, feedback on your work, and having a community is a great way to achieve that. As an example, after one of my first videos, I posted a poll asking for what sh I should work on next, feedback about my video quality and general comments. And in fact, I got a good amount of feedback um, as well as feed more feedback. And uh, um, well, well, a lot of feedback. <laughs> um, in fact, far more than I ever thought possible. So many people sharing their ideas, what they liked, didn't, and so on. I ended up closing the poll to further answer one month after uploading the video. But uh, I, I, you, you'll understand that uh, it helped me so much in the beginning, like improving myself, my the qualities of my video, the direction of the project. In fact, um, in fact, I, I managed to go through all of them through the following months, but damn, uh, 2,481 is a lot. And in fact, um, it's through those, uh, uh, those answers on the poll that I discovered and I was introduced to the Artificial Life uh, Conference um, and I found joint. So uh, there is so much incredible value uh, having that kind of uh, community and feedback from, uh, from a group that follows you. Uh, but having a, a community following your progress has many other advantages like providing you with some degree of accountability, uh, motivating you to keep you working and moral support when times are tough, when you feel like your whole project uh, was worth nothing and you're not proud of where your life is. Um, it's hard to understate, uh, to overstate how nice and warm my community has been to me and how, fact, how much it fueled my progress uh, on the project. Um, another important aspect, let's not lie to ourselves, is that projects need to be funded to continue and surprisingly a community is a powerful tool to help with that. I don't know too much about the process for asking for grants and financement, but uh, I have a strong feeling that having a community behind you as a proof of the validity and interest of your project can only help. A uh, community can also be of great help with supporting the project directly to, through periodic or continuous con crowdfunding. It can provide sustenance for you while working on the project or for the expense associated with it. As, ex as an example, I registered on Patreon and the community has been super supportive. So far, I've managed to invest in better sound equipment and soon to upgrade my computer for the first time in nine years which will go a long way working on simulations and things like that. So, of course, a community is also uh, a great help for potential crowdfunding campaigns on websites like Kickstarter, either by uh, contributing themselves or by sharing your campaign in social, on social media and such. In fact, a community is just as much um, the community itself as well as its exposure, your exposure to the more general public. And um, uh, uh, of course, across your community, depending on the broadness of your reach, you're bound to pique the interest of people not previously implicated in the field. I heard, I heard many times that 
artificial life, the field of uh, artificial life is looking for ways of inspiring newcomers to the field. And this is definitely a strong model of inspiration. Last we, lastly, we all know that artificial life is a field with an enormous potential for creating wonder and amazement, even for the unscientific and non-researchers. And um, the game of life is an extraordinary experiment, uh, example of an artificial life project that, are, that reached the mainstream and far-reaching appeal among the public, inspiring so many people, me including, to pursue a career in STEM and get involved, involved in the field of artificial life. And if you catch the interest of a large crowd, you'll inevitably also catch the attention of many people that have the desire and capacity to help you. Um, that combination being very important. Um, the added benefit of not being alone and by yourself anymore. Um, your project will progress in new ways and much further and faster. Having others help you is also an incredible way to learn a lot faster as it was in my case with the help I got from reworking and standardizing my code. In fact, uh, my code has come such a long way uh, since people started helping me on the project. Um, so another important thing, of course, memes, uh, which might not be of that meaningful to you, but it's hard to describe the effect of having your work digested by a community, which then identify with it enough to play around with the concepts and uh, down downfalls of your project. And if anything else, they offer a welcome distraction when you're not mo motivated to work. <laughs> And sometimes you'll manage to inspire artists that will mix their imagination to your work in ways that will inspire even you, fueling your desire to push further, bring you new ideas and, and challenging your, what you, where you were going with your project. Um, and while I agree that it feels like the field of artificial life is quite a niche subject, and I was convinced of this as I was working on the Bibit and re receiving very lukewarm feedback from my friends and family. But sh by sharing my work online, I've come to realize that artificial life definitely has a place on the internet because of the field's innate potential for amazement and the accessibility of the concept of life itself. And because of my experience, I'm convinced that there is a presently a near vacuum ready to be filled by artificial life projects. It's only up to us as a community to step up to the task and deliver. So now that we covered those two subjects, let's circle back to main one. I believe that there is a lot to gain from taking a little bit from the field of game development and putting some of that insight into your artificial life projects. Um, so first, that's not the main point, but let's get the obvious out of the way. For those developing artificial life simulations, games, game engines are a great, great way to go at it. They take care of many things out of the box for you and allow you to jump right into your implementation. Physics, uh, shapes, collisions, logic handling, and so on. So it's a very useful tool. It also allows you to add interactivity right off the bat. And the most engines will provide a very extensive community and documentation to ease your learning curve. But um, one of the most interesting point is that because of their wide popularity, many more collaborators will have familiarity with those platforms, increasing the ease of joining and so on. So in my opinion, the, as a whole, the field of game development is a perfect union of the two concepts I presented just before. So the, the a continuous project and also building a community, but also present new emerging point of inspiration to draw from. Um, first of all, it's clear to me that a lot has been done to better present the work done in artificial life. There is a lot of value in my opinion in working on better ways to synthesize your work like we established earlier, artificial life is a powerful subject to fascinate the mind, but has to be understood for that to be the case. I too often see uh, text-only papers that don't present, in my opinion, enough of their awesome and mind-blowing conclusions in an accessible or accessible enough manner. And talking about accessibility, well, a great way to present your project is to format it in a way that others can run it be it a game, a program, or a nice visual. 
allowing your audience to interact with your science, no matter what, will always bring it much further to the public space than otherwise. And that was the case for the Bibbits, uh, allowing uh, my audience to play with the simulation allowed me to get so much more feedback on the simulation itself, but then in thing, uh, on things I didn't put in much effort on before, like uh, interactivity and ease of use and things like that. If you have access to a community, of course, uh, we can draw inspiration from the field of game development in regard to early access. Um, the most, in the most basic sense, you can profit a lot from giving a continuous access to what you're developing and working on. Uh, I agree that it may require some additional work to put your work continuously in the hands of your community, but the value in continuous feed feedback is tremendous. As for my case, I get a constant stream of feedback on developed, uh, on developed features, uh, new ideas, and so much more. It might not be applicable to your case, but I, I encourage you to think about it at least. And finally, I can't overstate the feeling of so many people rooting for your projects to go forward. In my case alone, it allowed me to take this fun side project and transform it into a, pro a project of its own with its own life, uh, with possibilities to build my entire life around it and potentially having it support me. It's not a bit. It's now a big part of my life, and the drive and meaning I get from the community supporting my progress and the development of the project is so wide and profound. I'm convinced that many of you could also profit from this, and I encourage you to to look at it at least. Um, so I hope I managed to give you some ideas to draw inspiration from as well as convey my absolute certitude that more of us should try or end up publicizing uh, the field of artificial life. I agree that making your work more accessible represents some individual, individual additional work, but it's obvious to me that the community as a whole would profit a lot from it. Um, so thank you all for listening. I'll now take a few questions, maybe relating to the Bibbits, uh, my experience with uh, what I've been presenting or anything else really. So if I go to the chat, um, how did you begin building the community around your work? What would you recommend to the practitioners here who would want to do the same? Well, first of all, um, in my case, the first thing I did was just post a video on YouTube of uh, a very zoomed out view of the Bivet simulations. Um, it was very uh, unclear and what uh, what the, the concept was even, but still it managed to garner quite some attention. I then uploaded uh, a video after that uh, detailing what uh, how it worked and things like that. Um, so I would say that uh, the first thing to do would be uh, at least presenting your work. Um, or making sure that it's digestible to some kind of audience, uh, uploading it, uploading it to YouTube or something like this. Um, I, I absolutely believe that I'm not particularly good, or I don't have something incredible to show off. Uh, either I'm, I don't even have uh, incredible like editing skills. Uh, I just believe that there is a strong vacuum in the public uh, interest for artificial life content. So I encourage you to, again, go, go and try your way with it. Um, next question. Did you open source the code or do you do all on your own? Um, uh, I used to do most of uh, the project on my own, uh, working by myself. But since maybe uh, the start of January, I started having people helping me out. Um, and collaborating with me and of course uh, the, the project has grown a lot further and uh, went a lot further than I could ever think it could um, now that I have the help of a few people. Of course it's a little more complicated nowadays with uh, the pandemic and all that, uh, not everyone has time but still my code is much more standard and I learned actually a lot just by having people help me. As for open source. Uh, the project is not public yet. It's still in my private uh, GitHub repository, but it's still in my, my goal to eventually open source it. 
and make sure that it's accessible to uh, the community and they can play around with it. Um, okay, so next question. Um, how much time do you spend per week maintaining and building the community around your project? Um, my first answer would be not enough. <laughs> um, actually, I in the good weeks, maybe I spend uh, maybe 20 hours um, working on the project as a whole, but that's mainly like programming, researching, um, things like that, that uh, any project does. Um, and that's in the good weeks. Like I said, this is still a part-time project for me. So um, I still have a full-time job as a system engineer. Uh, yeah, but uh, out much time specifically on maintaining the community, maybe uh, five hours per good week. And like I said, not enough, but it's, it doesn't have to be that long. You just have to, to think about it and do some things. Uh, I'm trying to be more uh, active on Twitter uh, and on Reddit, although my most of my time actually uh, is interacting with my pa my Patreons on Discord uh, on my private channel that my Patreons have access to. I try. To, I, I'm there pretty much every day. So um, yeah. Next question: um, A community could have many developers working on many new methods slash algorithms, but they could also cause conflicts. Do you have thoughts on how to manage a community of developers considering those initial conflicts? Um, well, um, GitHub is a very powerful source control uh, uh, system. It allows us to work on parallel branch of the code and things like that without too much conflict um, and merge back when we have developed specific features. Um, that being said, um, there, there needs to be a director somewhere, uh, a direction that's chosen by someone and that, that kind of, uh, glue everything together. In fact, a project manager in some sort, uh, would help a great deal. And I've been kind of doing that job, um, because I've seen like people wanting to play around and develop their things. And in fact, it's, it creates more job for everyone else uh, when that happens. So yeah, it's a balancing act, but it's always so helpful. Uh, I've actually learned a, a lot since uh, people started amping me and yeah. Um, so next question, what uh, language is the project written in? Um, it's written in C sharp. Uh, that's one of the two main um, two main libraries on Unity, uh, not libraries, but uh, code base. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward, and uh, there's actually a lot of depth to that language. Um, I've learned a lot so far. Um, yeah, so Laurent, I, t I think you have you had a question. Um, maybe you can uh, you can say it yourself instead of me reading your your comment. It might be clearer if I explain it. Um, yeah, absolutely, I'm not the best for those things. What, what sort of surprised me at first is when I visited your YouTube channel and saw that some videos had like 200,000 views and you know, people were very interested in watching evolutionary dynamics in real time. I thought that's awesome. And, and, and there's probably a lot of scientists who would pay to have like this many participants and this much feedback on, on their own experiments. So I'm curious if you've thought about um, doing anything where there's a co-evolution of the community with the system. And in, in my question in the text, I, I say there's a talk in the next session by, by David Matthews, I think, on the, this feedback, having like people vote and having like human votes participate in the fitness of, of, um, of agents. Um, mm -hmm. So people could vote on their favorite like vivid and it like makes it makes them stronger somehow. I, I don't know if you've thought of anything like that, but I think this is like a poorly understood um, system. Yeah, absolutely. Just um, that's like uh, one thing I thought about, uh, but it's very long term for me because, uh, as I said, uh, I don't have that much time to to work on this. But I think eventually, like uh, the Bibis hosted on a, on a platform where uh, we could either share different uh, agents and evolutions and uh, things like that, different uh, Bibits. 
to and maybe uh, try the the bivets from your someone else simulation and uh, see how they fare in your own and things like that uh because i do have the i do have that possibility right now but it's very like uh, pretty much the bibit is printed to a json and <laughs> you can upload it back but uh, it's very uh, like uh, crude as of mm -hmm. now but yeah having uh, but there is still like uh, some sort of through the the interactivity of the the simulation uh, there's a lot that can be done uh, manually. Like you can manually select red bibits if you prefer them and like steal the food from other bibits <laughs> and things like that uh, without a problem. But yeah, it would be very interesting to see what like um, a Twitch chat <laughs> right, exactly. would, you would do with, uh, with uh, the bibits. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, if everybody's okay, I think we're good to end the session right now. Thank you very sure. much, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Sure.